Welcome in to Bears Weekly, a Chicago Bears Network production. Download the Chicago Bears official app, brought to you by Verizon, to follow the team on the go. Bears Weekly is brought to you by Advocate Healthcare, Athletico Physical Therapy, Beth Rivers, CDW, Connie's Pizza, IGS Energy, and Miller Lite. Here are your hosts, Jeff Choniak, a.k.a. the Mayor of Bearsville, and his sidekick, Tom the Surfmaster Thayer. Pleasant good evening, everybody. Later this evening, we find out if the 30 Bears already enshrined in Canton and the Pro Football Hall of Fame will become, uh, well, more company. Veterans Committee finalists and legendary defensive tackle Steve McMichael, return star Devin Hester, a Hall of Fame finalist for three years in a row. We'll find out shortly if they'll get the gold jackets officially and their bronze bust displayed for perpetuity. Exciting night ahead indeed. I'm Jeff Joniak with Super Bowl Bear Tom Thayer. And thanks to producers Jordan Trudup, Dan Barilli, also to Kevin Zipak of the ESPN 1000 Studios, executive producer of the Bears Radio Network is Eric Ostrowski. Also joining us from Vegas at the Super Bowl. He's been working all week from Sirius XM NFL Radio. is moving the chains. Jim Miller. Tom, we start with you. Uh, great anticipatory night. A lot of rumors out there, obviously. Uh, but until we hear it for official, I know uh, as an ex-teammate of Steve McMichael for one and a broadcaster for Devin and Julius Peppers for that matter, it's a big night. Yeah, you know, Jeff, I just wish that we could react to the stories because with anticipation of it all happening, I'd like to be able to talk honestly about a guy that deserves a Hall of Fame. I'm talking about a teammate, first of all, and Steve McMichael. He deserves it on what he was able to accomplish, the impression that he left on the league, the improvement that he helped his football team when he came aboard uh, the Bears, but his commitment of him, his self and his life to uh, professional football. And then, obviously, Devin is a game changer. He's left more good memories in our mind and your broadcasting voice than a lot of other guys they have along the way. And we all have tons of respect for Julius Peppers, what the type of player he was, who he was compared to, and his accomplishments and results. And, Jim, you wore the uniform of a bear as well, so a lot of pride uh, as well for the charter franchise of the National Football League, and I'm certain that uh, you long felt that McMichael, Hester included, should have been in the Hall of Fame uh, even before this. Yes, and, uh, you know, I, I think it's, it's, it is safe to say that Mago's getting in. You know, I, I can pretty much uh, say that. I know uh, Misty, his wife, I, I was texting back, forth with, back and forth with her. She's out here in uh, Las Vegas for a reason. Uh, because Mongo's getting in, and he's well deserved, and and Tom can talk about him as a teammate more than I can. I can only talk as me as a, a, a lover of football. You know, watching the tenacity that he played with, and and the fierceness and the competitiveness that he played, and what he's what he stood for from afar. I know Tom can go a lot deeper than that. As for Devin Hester, you know, with the current rules in the NFL with the the kick returns, you know, it's pretty much been eliminated with the new rule. We'll have to see what the NFL does down at the NFL owners meeting. Supposedly they want to implement what is the old XFL uh, kick return and how the XFL ran it, but no one has done what Devin Hester has done. And I think that's what swayed the voters. You know, as for right now, he he's the number one guy all time. You know, you could make an argument. Why wasn't he a a first ballot hall of famer? Because he's done more than any kick returner has has ever done. So uh, that one sounds like uh, it's in the books as well. Well, I'll say this about calling all those, except for one with the Atlanta Falcons that put him over the top past Deion Sanders. Uh, I, I haven't seen anything like it uh, to have it to be repetitively done, and you're you're still kicking to him. And then for periods of time, they weren't kicking to him. They were afraid of him, and he was getting frustrated. It affected his play in anything else, including at wide receiver and the, the pressure. And I just was on with uh, Cap and Waddle. Uh, on ESPN 1000, and we, we talked about this because I believe that Devin, from the time he started playing youth football, knew he was going to be a Hall of Famer, and he charted that path long, long time ago because he always knew he could do it, and just how he returned the ball, the arrogance of which he returned that ball, and the confidence and the competitiveness of the opposition, the coaches, the special teams coordinators, the punters, the kickers, Eh, let's give it a shot. Maybe he, you know, maybe we'll make a, a story out of him by not uh, letting him uh, get in the end zone. And he proved everybody wrong every step of the way, Tommy. Every well, step of the way. Jeff, let me ask you something about confidence and arrogance. 
Are you glad that he returned the one in Atlanta, or else you would have called every one no, of I, his kicks and listen, punts? I, I, I would have loved listen, it. It, it, yeah. it. Listen, me and, and Devin wasn't a bear at the time, so we never cheered against him. However, if throughout the course of your broadcasting career, you could say I called every single one of Devin's returns throughout a Hall of Fame career, that would be something amazing to say. Yeah, no but, question. You know. Yeah, but Wes Durham, uh, the Atlanta Falcons uh, radio guy, uh, Jimmy, he 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 did give me a, a, a little shout out, uh, like my good friend Jeff Joniak would say, Devin Hester, you are ridiculous. He said it. So yeah. thank you, <laughs> Wes Durham. That means a lot. I, you know, you never know who you're going to call in this in this league, right? And and he was ju- he just resonated with everybody, and I get more questions about where did ridiculous come from, even today. Well, it's the yeah. genesis of that. It was the it was the second return against St. Louis. The Bears were blowing out the Rams. They were expecting an onside kick, and I saw the the distance between Devin and the nearest approaching defender. He blew by him like nothing. I just I just lost it. I, lo- I, I you can't believe this stuff. I just yeah. you just can't believe it, Jimmy. Well, you, it's perfectly framed, and that's what you do as a radio guy. And he's framed it perfectly. It's ridiculous what he was doing. Yeah, it was, was ridic- It was ridiculous at the time of yeah, how he was, was just making special teams play to a, another level. I, I'll never forget the game where Mike Shanahan is the head coach of the Washington Redskins at that time. Time formerly the Redskins, I should say, and Keith Burns, who or not Keith Burns, uh, Keith Butler, who was their special teams coach. And we had uh, we had. Uh, played together uh, at, at some uh, at one point and he became their special teams coach and Mike Shanahan challenged him or Keith Burns excuse me and there was uh, Mike Shanahan challenged him and they kicked to him twice and he had two returns in that game and it basically destroyed the game uh, why coaches were, would even kick to this guy or challenge him is, is beyond me and, and that goes back to the Super Bowl against Tony Dungy if you remember Peyton Manning was screaming on the sideline who the heck made that call to kick to this guy? And it goes back to the head coach. And Peyton right. was upset from the first snap. Yep, and you know what happened after that, Tom? Tom smacked yep. Jimmy, smacked me so hard on the rear end, which he used to do before every broadcast early in my career anyway to make sure I'm, I'm ready to go. And it hurt. Like, yeah. It stung you. It got your mind off the nerves. And, and he turned to me with a finger in my face. He said, the game hasn't even started yet. And he was so right. And if they yeah. just would have continued to run the football, we would have been talking about a second Super Bowl champion in Chicago. I really believe that. Anyway, we got to take a break, boys. Sit back. we got some time in between. Earlier today, we, we visited with uh, Jim, your old teammate, Jerry Azuma, uh, for Great. some 20 minutes, talking about all things very lovely man, great player for the Bears. We talk with him coming up next here on ESPN Chicago and the Bears Radio Network. This is Bears Weekly with the voice of the Bears for 23 years, Jeff Joniak on the Bears Radio Network. This portion of Bears Weekly is brought to you by CDW, people to get it. Welcome back to Bears Weekly. Jeff Joniak and Tom Thayer, Jim Miller to rejoin the program from the Super Bowl in Vegas in just a moment. And joining us now, our good friend, the president of Bears Care, the charitable arm of the Chicago Bears, one of the most exciting Bears players for a seven-year stretch from 1999 to 2005, the New Hampshire running back turned cornerback and Pro Bowl kick return of the one and only Jerry Azuma, who still, every time I see him, is fit to hit, looks like he should still be playing. I don't know how you do it. What are you, uh, 35? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, we'll just stick with that. <laughs> but, no, you you have kept yourself in tip top rock solid shape and uh is this something of significance in your life that you pay attention to every single day well i have to you know um you know your body starts talking to you you have to start listening to it especially when you get older um i have a six-year-old and an eight-year-old so they basically keep me um, active as much as possible so it's all about them right now so i have to make sure that um I'm able to move around for them. By the way, I, I love the names of your children, Santiago and Valentino. They're, and they're, Valentino those guys, yeah. that, either they're movie stars, starting <laughs> quarterbacks. Uh, I don't know, but they're, they're the going to be. The are really big. Right. Like, like, tell me the genesis of those names. <laughs> so um, Bianca, my wife, she is uh, Mexican, and we wanted to go with uh, a name that just kind of was like Spanish influenced because they have a whole bunch of African names right behind them. So uh, we went with um, Santiago. Um, he was born on Christmas Eve. So 
um, a couple of hours later, he would have been Jesus. Who knows? But um, <laughs> we went with the saint instead for Santiago. So that's how that turned out. And then Valentino is just a name that we've always loved and admired. And uh, we went with that with our youngest. Uh, Jerry, <clears throat> so you figure where your body's at at this point. What is the state of the game in your mind of a father for young kids? And I'm going to follow yeah. up with a question after that, but let's talk about that first. Yeah, I mean, I get that question asked a lot. Um, you know, my kids uh, in the fall, it was their first time playing flag football, and they absolutely loved it. And it was the first time that I, I was able to actually throw the ball at, at them and have them catch it and, you know, just kind of learn the foundation and fundamentals of the game. So they really liked it. I think uh, I grew up in Oklahoma. So um, I grew up in Oklahoma in the uh, late 70s, early 80s. So football was life, and it was all about hitting people as hard as you could. It was always about um, being aggressive, you know, the Oklahoma drills and things like that. So I learned to hit and be aggressive at a very early age. And then now looking back at it, and now that I have kids, I'm thinking to myself, well, maybe that isn't the direction that I necessarily need to go because you can build a strong foundation and really learn the game of, of football and love the game of football without – having that physical contact. You know, I think flag football builds a strong foundation. You can learn the X's and O's and things like that. So I'm more of the standpoint of, you know, learning the game and having a lot of fun and running around, which you can do with flag football without the physicality. And then later on, once your body starts to mature and you feel like, you know, you can lace up the, the, the cleats and see if you're really about that life to take some hits, then we can find out. So I would say like, you know, junior high, high school-ish is when you can start putting on pads and see if you really want that contact. Well, you know, you are also a guy that brought people out of their seats or made them stay in their seats for a part of the return game. And I think you kind of forge an opportunity for yourself in the NFL through your ability in the return game. Yeah. Um, give me your feelings about the state of the return game in today's NFL. <laughs> Do you want to see it? changed and stay in as significantly as has been throughout the hundred years of the NFL, or are you okay with the changes that you're seeing? Yeah. Well, the return game and special teams has always been a dynamic thing in the NFL for a long period of time. And I understand the changes that they've made. They've, they've made these changes due to safety and safety concerns and things like that. So I understand it. And they made drastic sweeping changes, you know, to kind of push the, the, the game, forward as we now know it and try to get away from you know the the big time collisions with you know running down on kickoff you know we have guys like Is israel adonage who's running down at you know 300 pounds running as fast as he can to like knock somebody's block off so i understand getting that part out of the game but they can't swing it too far because these day these games and these plays are extremely dynamic um when you're talking about a person like devin hester who's um, hopefully we'll get into the Hall of Fame uh, tonight. He basically flipped, you know, the 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 field position. He changed the whole dynamic of a game. He changed game plans. He changed so many different elements that the game presented. And I think that I I don't want to see that go away. And it's it's definitely have gone it's gone away. And you know, return is the the mo one of the most exciting things to start off a football game. Punt returns are extremely exciting because if you have a person like a Devin Hester or a Johnny Knox or a Glenn Milburn or Daniel Manning, you know, the list goes on and on and on. These guys can really do incredible things just off of one play. So um, I, I think the NFL is they have their concerns and I understand their concerns, but I just don't want to see them eliminate, you know, um, special teams uh, return plays. Former Bears cornerback kick return star pro bowler Jerry Azuma with us on Bears Weekly. Jeff and Tom with you here on ESPN 1000 of the Bears Radio Network. So to that point, a uh, couple of things. One, back to the flag football and then we'll get back into the kick return thing. I, I heard a quote from Brock Purdy, the starting quarterback for Sunday Super Bowl for the 49ers and my fellow Iowa State alum, Love that guy. He started playing flag football at 12. Yeah. And he said, hey, it was a quicker game. My decision-making process, I had to think quickly. And that's mm -hmm. kind of transferred over to him as a quick-thinking quarterback. I thought that was an interesting statement about, you know, because flag football is going to be an Olympic sport. It is. It's, it's mushrooming, no question about it. Uh, and it's including girls and women, so I think it's fantastic for the sport of football in general because the game's always under attack. So that's just my statement about that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so looking back at your career as a kick returner, a couple of seasons you had over 40 returns. 
the average number of returns this year for an NFL team was 18. That's oh. it. Uh, the, I think the, the Rams had nine returns. So you've mm-hmm. eliminated the third phase of the game because on top of that, the punt return game, Zoom and Tom, uh, the kickers have become so, so good, athletic, yeah. big, big legs. They're either kicking it out of bounds or really a lot of hang time for fair catches. And so mm-hmm. to me, the more dangerous of the two, and I didn't play the game, so maybe I'm speaking too much here, would be the punt return. You look at what happened to Tariq Cohen shortly after he – uh, signed his long-term contract, gets jumbled up there and suffers a serious injury that he's still coming back from. Um, yeah. But they have to. They have to find a way to keep that excite- exciting element in the game. It's a football play. And, you know, you suffered some injuries, though. And I don't know. Yeah. I, I can't recall. You had a pair of neck injuries. You had a hip mm-hmm. problem. Was it more from playing corner or was it more from the return game? I just think it was just from playing football, you know. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, I spent a lifetime playing football and people are like, all right, you played seven years in the NFL, you know, relatively short career. And, you know, um, why did you retire so early? And I was like, well, actually, you know, I started playing football at the age of six, you know, and I played till, you know, 28, 29 years old. So that's a lot of time of, you know, pounding my body and um, really playing football and really getting after it, mixing up, um, mixing up myself with football. So it was a lot of a lot of time. Um, between starting and loving football at the age of six or early age, going all the way through, you know, my professional football career. So um, injuries do happen. This is the game of football, you know, and I understand what the NFL is trying to do with slow down injuries and prevent them as much as possible. But at the same time, I'm about the integrity of the football game as well. And I feel like the the integrity of the game is really taking a hit at this point. Um I feel like, you know, the league is leaning towards protecting certain some people and not necessarily protecting all people. Um, and that's a bigger conversation that we can get into. But um, I just think just looking at it, I just think that, you know, it's still football and there should still be some type of integrity that's still in place. And at the same time, you do have to be mindful of like the egregious, you know, for example, headshots or uh, neck shots. I mean, I think that we all know what those egregious uh, headshots look like, but, you know, sliding last minute and then getting hit, you know what I'm saying? doesn't really feel like the egregious headshot or the unnecessary roughness or taking a quarterback down, even if he's off balance and then trying to brace yourself so that you don't land fully on him. You know, like there, there's a lot of little situations that happen that we have to be mindful of. And I think that the NFL is doing all that they can to protect people, but at the same time, they're losing a lot of the integrity of the football game. Jerry, you look at the two-way player that Deion Sanders has in Colorado. Then you think of some of the untapped potential of a guy like Devin Hester. But I remember during your career, I used to sit with Jay Hilgenberg, and he would sit there and say week in and week out, one of the best running backs on the Chicago Bears is Jerry (laughs) Azuma. When you think about the game and where it's at now and the potential you had back then, could we have seen Jerry Azuma and the backfield as a running back on an NFL level? Well, absolutely, Tom. (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) Um, You know know I'm going to say yes to that. Um, Growing up, I've I've always been a running back, and I've always been on the offensive side of the football. Um, I've watched Walter Payton um, in my days in Oklahoma, and that's who I try to be. I try to be a running back, and I try to be Walter Payton. So um, continued on being a running back through high school, through college, and then when I got to the pros, you know, I started running backwards, which was completely different and and very different than what I was used to. So um, the challenges were definitely there. But in the NFL, I think that there is some room right now for, you know, two way players. I mean, there are guys out there that can that are very dynamic on the offensive side of the football and defensive side of the ball. So why not give them an opportunity to go out there and show their greatness on both sides of the football field? You know, so um, I think that we might see a lot more of that. Um Because things change in the NFL, as we know, Um, the running back position has changed a lot. It's, it's no, no longer like really ground and pound. Now they're, they're looking more for like scat backs and, and guys that can, you know, step in the slot or guys that can catch the ball out of the backfield. So the the traditional running back, so to speak, or like even the quarterback, you know, pocket quarterback, you have to be able to run these days. And now they have designed runs with these big time quarterbacks that, 
the overall like positions, um, the foundation is there, but like, I think that they're morphing into something different. And I think that you'll see a little bit more. I would like to see a little bit more two way players, you know, because there are a lot of dynamic players in the football league. Yeah, you know, you think of the play specifically like the jet sweep and how much that has infiltrated the offense, whether it's the distraction of, of the motion that tries to get a defense off balance or the actual handoff at that play specifically. It seems there's been some plays that have been developed since even your time from the NFL that have could have been a part of you being on the offensive side of the ball more often. And Jeff and I were talking about it even with a guy like Devin, because Devin's never going to be on a field like Tariq Hill, and you're right. not going to be an- announcing defensively where he's at in what he could possibly be doing. But, like, right. those plays specifically have changed the course of some of the athletes in the NFL today. Yeah, and I think that you'll see more of that um, moving forward. Like, you know, the evolution of the the football player, um, bigger, stronger, faster, more dynamic, can do different things. You know, you look at, um, like, T- uh, I think his name is Taysom for uh, the Saints. The, yeah, the Taysom Hill, yeah. They, Taysom Hill, they use him, and he's very dynamic. He can throw the ball. He can run the ball. You know, he can pass the ball. He, he can do a, a magnitude of, of a lot of different things. So I think that you'll find um, a lot of players coming up and, and trying to find, like, the offensive coordinators and defensive coordinators to try to figure out the best usage of these dynamic players. Awesome. I think that you'll start to see more of that. There's one at Utah. I just did the Senior Bowl for Sirius XM NFL Radio, and Sion Avaki is uh, – Gets a really good running back and catch the football, but he's a, a yeah. bad man at safety. So, you know, and, and I'm looking back at your statistics, and you had 352 tackles in your career, according to uh, Pro Football Reference anyway. You, you may have got more from uh, Lovey Smith, or excuse me, uh, from your coaching <laughs> staffs. Uh, but uh, did you think when you started in the NFL, when you get drafted in the fifth round, that you would have had 352 rushes as opposed to 352 tackles, at least in your career? <laughs> And and, and that you know we've talked about this before, just to to convince you that it's gonna. Hey, Jerry, we need you to run backwards and play corner. Yeah, it was it was very weird. Um, I don't know if a lot of people understand that story, but um, I started getting uh, in college. I started getting so, you know some calls and some scouts coming up saying that I could possibly be a defensive back. And then I was, I just really didn't understand it because I, I went forward so well <laughs> and uh, won the Walter Payton award and rushed for, you know, 6,200 yards and so on and so forth. So I felt really confident in my, in my um, ability to run the football. And then I went to BC's uh, pro day, which was the biggest college that was in the area. And I did running back drills. And then afterwards, the scout comes by and he says, Hey, there's a little buzz going on that you could possibly be a defensive back. I'd like to take you through some D- DB drills. And I said, you know, I've never done this in my life, but if you think that it's worth it, then I'll give it a shot. So he took me through the drills. Um, later on, he shook my hand. It was actually Phil Emery, who was a area scout for the Chicago Bears back then, turned GM, you know. Um, so he was the one that was probably very instrumental in drafting me, but he was the first one to say, hey, I think that you could be a defensive back at the next level. Like, let's send you through some DB drills and see what you can do. And then after that, I went to the combine and did running back drills. And, you know, the whole DB thing just never really took off. So I was like, okay, well, that was that was quick lived. And I'm just going to be a running back until I got drafted by the Chicago Bears. And on the phone, they told me that they want to see me as a, a, a defensive back. Unreal. Uh, you were also a teammate of Ryan Day, the Ohio State uh, head football coach uh, from New yes. Hampshire as well. Uh, some yeah. other NFL players. But so, you know, the debate is raging on. Uh, Justin Fields, number one pick in the draft. And from our perspective, it's been a 50-50 split. Where, where are you standing at this point? Well, uh, looking at the team, I think that polls uh, basically stripped everything down and he's building this team up in the right way. Um Obviously, the draft capital is very important, as we know, and getting, you know, key free agents, you know, to plug and play will really make this thing go. So, um, you know, looking at this whole thing with Justin Fields, I think that he can. I think that he has a lot of potential. I think that his ceiling is definitely high. He has a lot of potential. I think that he has to get the right system around him. He has to get more help around him and things will start to naturally happen. I think last year he started to take off. Um, Obviously, you know, he had his dips. And he had his moments, but um, at the same time, he has, he had a lot of flashes of really good things. And then you put a person like DJ Moore around him, who 
arguably had his best, you know, season of his career, you know, 1,300 yards, eight touchdowns, almost 100 yards, you know, receiving. I feel like if you add an, add more pieces to Justin and then a, a strong running game as well, a strong offensive line that's that's really good at the point of attack and creating, you know, creases for him. I, and, and then just a system of utilizing his strengths and his talents. Um, he's good on the run. Um, he's good at sprint out and roll out to misdirection and things like that three step uh, drop he can get the ball out so i think that he has some things that um that can be very beneficial moving forward i don't know if i really want to hit the hard reset button with a brand new quarterback you know and and it's a rookie quarterback too so there's no real guarantees um i I like the soft resets and and i also like putting more pieces around justin fields so that's where i stand with this whole thing put pieces around justin fields and last year if you look at at a lot of the games, we were really, really close. We were really, really close. Um, and I think that if they keep on building the pieces and putting things around Justin Fields, I think that we'll be in a really good situation because the offense is, you know, they're coming. The defense is playing extremely solid special teams, obviously. And then coaching, the coaching really, uh, the, here's the thing. The offensive coordinator is extremely important, just as important as the quarterback. And you have to get a person that can put people in the right place at the right time and really utilize their their um, their their talent and their skill set. So hopefully this coaching staff can get together and they can um, work with Justin Fields to bring out the best in him and build pieces around him. And that's where I stand on that. You know, Jerry, one thing you can't deny about the decision that you're going to make future is how the finances figure in on the deal. So when you talk about college players with NIL and then you think about what the quarterbacks are making, especially in their second contract, that's, you know, that's not a subject that you can't bring into the conversation. My question to you, though, is we never had the luxury and the opportunity. What is your feeling about the NIL money? Because I think it changes um, everything from college all-star games to the amount of money some of these kids are making yeah. and not playing very much. But what what's your feeling of, on NIL money? i tell you what, Tom, you and I were just too early. You were just <laughs> too early. Um, the NIL has really changed the game and really changed the dynamic of, you know, college sports in general. Um, these guys are, you know, pretty much professionals now they're they're making money and with with that comes business decisions so the fact that these guys are like holding out of you know bowl games and things like that it it the feel the spirit of you know college football has really taken a hit i think that yeah. you know college football was all about the guys the, the kids i should say that want to go out there and give it their all and win a championship for their team for their university I felt like that spirit and that desire was was in them. But now it's all like the business decisions. Everyone is making a business decision on whether they want to play, whether they want to leave this team and go to another team and play for this coach and that coach. So I, I think the spirit of the NIL and like the portal, for example, was good. You know, I think that they wanted it to, to be a, a good option for kids to exercise and things like that. But now I feel like it's spiraling out of control and they're trying to get it back somehow. And I feel like it, they might not be able to get it back right. at this point because it's just gone. But, um, you know, I, I understand why they were trying to do it, but you know, it's, it's very unfortunate because guys are jumping into the portal also. And then you hear horror stories too, that, you know, guys are, are feeling that they are more than what they really are. They get into the portal and then they just get stuck in that portal and then they might have to come back to that team. And then now the, you know, the administration and the team and the coaches are looking at you like, well, wait a minute, why should I even, you know, invest in you, you know, when you decided to go into the portal or another situation too, with high school, with uh, college coaches is, you know, instead of developing younger players, why don't I just go into the portal and just get a, a rough diamond that I can develop you know, and a, a upperclassmen that's had some um, success, you know, playing at their respective school. And I can plug them into this this type of uh, system and get the best out of them. Why should I even develop? So there are some issues that need to be worked out. Hopefully they get worked out soon. All right, Jerry, uh, one more to let you go. And we really appreciate it here on Bears Weekly with Jeff and Tom. Jerry Azuma, the trivia question about trivia questions. Who scored the last touchdown at Old Soldier Field before it was torn down and rebuilt into the current stadium? 
The answer would be Jerry Azuma and his pick six of Donovan McNabb, the 39-yard touchdown return in that 0-1 divisional playoff against the Eagles, quarterbacked by our own Jim Miller uh, before yes. he was injured by Hugh Douglas, sadly. Uh, yeah. uh, and, and, wow, that's something that I bet a lot of folks would not have that answer. But you yeah, remember it I'm vividly. Sure. Long time you, ago. And you were on the 05 team. Uh, you got hurt in that game. And then, you know, the 06, they go to the Super Bowl. So there's a lot there in our final question here. Uh, as you got a taste of the Super Bowl run, 01, 05, and then they go on 06, yeah. how much regret did you have that you, you were not able to continue or forced to retire because of your injuries? And uh, and then the final cap for who you who you picking on Sunday? You know what? Um, looking back at my career, I have nothing bad to say about it. I mean, it was an incredible time to be alive. It was a fantastic ride. Um, when I got into the league, I thought I'd be a running back. And <laughs> they were like, no, nope, yeah. you're going to be a defensive back. So I got into a situation that I had I had no clue what was going on. And everything was just happening 100 miles an hour. But the good thing is, is that I played with some incredible guys on defense. I mean, some incredible guys on defense so that they made the um, the transition easier for me. So um, I, I don't regret any period of time that I played with the Chicago Bears. It was a fantastic time. I played with some incredible guys and um, really love the, the fan base. I'm still in Chicago. So Chicago is home. So it has brought me uh, an incredible life. But um, when we're talking about the Super Bowl this time, the 49ers versus the Chiefs, man, you know, I, I didn't think that the Chiefs were going to be able to go to the Buffalo Bills and beat them, but they did. And then they went into Baltimore and then beat them decisively. And I bet against them, basically. I said, you know, they're, they're not going to be able to do this. I just think that it's too much for them. But they went in there. Mahomes was able to do his thing. The defense of the Chiefs has really stepped up tremendously, and I think that that's going to be the tipping point of this game. But um, and then um, you know their head coach uh, Andy Reid, he's he's really done a great job of putting guys in the positions to make plays and win football games. And then you have you know San Fran, who is just loaded on offense and defense with talent, and Brock Purdy is doing a, a fantastic job just feeding his playmakers and letting them make plays. So this is going to be an incredible Super Bowl. I am looking forward to it. I can't wait. In terms of like a prediction, I'm leaning towards the Chiefs. <laughs> Definitely <laughs> leaning because I don't want to get burned again. I think that's what, the, what it is. I just don't want to get burned again. Travis Kelsey, I mean, 11 targets, 11 receptions. I, I just don't understand how he gets open all the damn time. Like, mm. come on, guys. Like, somebody get him. Get him. <laughs> and I don't know if um, they're going to be able to cover him. Uh, the, the way that they need to for this game. But, you know, two defensive, uh, really good defensive, talented teams. We'll see what happens, but I'm I'm leaning towards the Chiefs on this one. All right. It's all good. Thank you, guys. Love being on. Coming back, Thanks, Jim Miller rejoins the program here on ESPN 1000 and the Bears Radio Network. This is Bears Weekly with the voice of the Bears for 23 years, Jeff Joniak on the Bears Radio Network. This segment of Bears Weekly brought to you by Athletico Physical Therapy. Visit athletico.com to request an in-clinic or virtual appointment and start feeling better tomorrow. Jeff and Tom and Jim Miller from Vegas at the Super Bowl. How's it been out there, Jim? Uh, crazy, as you can uh, imagine, Jeff. Today's probably the, the busiest day, obviously, of more the you know the stars, guys that are in town to enjoy. And that's the reason why is tonight, tonight is the honors uh, party, but it's picking up steam, brother. And I'll tell you what, uh, Vegas uh, – and from all the acts that are here, like you two played at the Stratosphere last night, that was a, a big show in town. But pretty much every place has is, is got a show, and everybody's having a great time. What's the takeaway overall about having a Super Bowl there? I mean, you got entertainment built in as it is. Uh, what, what's your takeaway of, of that place having a Super Bowl? Yeah, I think they're going to pull it off. Basically, both teams are staying about 45 miles outside of the city. You know, both uh, the San Francisco 49ers and, and Kansas City, they didn't even want the players around it. Because like you said, it's basically one big party uh, that's going on. Everybody's enjoying it. Uh, there's a ton of events that are that are scheduled uh, downtown. And, it, you know, as the NFL always does, they kind of go in the city. They take it over. There's banners everywhere. Everything's uh, about the game and all the promotional aspects of it. But I think overall it's gone off without a hitch. You know, they really have done a nice job. And even through NFL employees, like imagine me here, 
you know, I'm here because we're part of the NFL and, you know, basically I'm a part of the league employee with Sirius being a partner with the NFL. We're not even allowed to gamble in the, in the, uh, in the casinos. So the NFL is serious about it. There is an integrity aspect to it and that you have been forewarned. And, uh, from what I understand, everybody that I've seen has been abiding by it. Hey, Jim, who's the early fan base support? Who would, who's the dominating colors that you're seeing in the facilities or on the streets? I, I think it's pretty even, although San Francisco travels well, too. They've got a very big contingent, you know, because they've got rich history. They're going for their sixth Super Bowl uh, victory as well. They've got a great presence, and 49er fans have a lot of pride. But I'll tell you what, Chiefs fans, with the role they're on, they, you know, they want to be a part of history and what they're trying to accomplish. And here, Patrick Mahomes is trying to play it down, you know, that, hey, I'm not even halfway to reaching uh, Tom Brady. But make no mistake about this, Chiefs fans know that they're a part of something great here. This is kind of a mini dynasty uh, that's going on, and they're kind of the villain. You know, when you look at NFL fans, they always want to see something new, new teams and things like that. You know, you look at the run the Patriots went on, and I think the, uh, the, when you look at the Chiefs right now, they're kind of the villain because they've been a part of, you know, think of the Super Bowls that they've been in. This is their third one. Patrick Mahomes knows anything, doesn't know anything else other than playing in championship games for his six-year career. That's pretty crazy when you think about it. Yeah, it is. And so is this. 11-0 and playing in domes with 3,300 passing yards, 26 touchdowns, and two interceptions. Yes, they will be playing inside on Sunday. Let's take a break. We'll break it down, more X's and O's, and get Jim and Tom's thoughts here on Bears Weekly on ESPN 1000 and the Bears Radio Network. This is Bears Weekly with the voice of the Bears for 23 years, Jeff Joniak on the Bears Radio Network. This segment of Bears Weekly is brought to you by IGS Energy. Jeff Joniak, top there. Jim Miller camped out in Vegas for the Super Bowl. Jim, give us a couple of keys to victory for whomever. Let's go Chiefs first and then go for the 49ers. We'll give you, and then we'll get Tom's keys as well. Yeah, I think for the, for the Chiefs, I agree with Jerry Azuma. The Chiefs have been playing awesome defensively. From week one all the way to the championship game and their victory over Baltimore, Think about Baltimore. They were averaging 34 points a game at home in their building. Dude, they held held them to 10, 10 points. And Steve Spagnuolo upped his blitzes. He was really blitzing to stop the run, and it was so successful, he said, let's keep it going. And so I think they're going to be very aggressive. They're a very good group. They're very versatile. I think they put Chris Jones more as a, a defensive end at times. And then I look at San Francisco's defense. They've been gashed as of late. You know, you look at the, they're, you know, they beat the Detroit Lions, but Detroit Lions had 148 yards rushing at halftime. And Andy Reid has been having an uptick in terms of their carries to Pacheco. Pacheco's been getting about 24 carries a game, and then you'll factor in a, a, couple, of, a couple of pass uh, receptions as well. So they've been pretty solid on both sides of the ball, although they're still not scoring a lot of points. They're averaging in the mid-20s only. So it's going to be key for them to ball control, time of possession. And Patrick Mahomes was able to do that against Baltimore. You know, that was a high blitz team that led the league in sacks with 60. He has not been sacked yet in the postseason, and he has yet to have a turnover. He could break Tom Brady's record of over 223 passes without throwing an interception. As for the keys for the 49ers, I just think, you know, young Brock Purdy, he struggled in half, you know, half the games, both games that he started here in the postseason, uh, he basically, you know, the half didn't go right. One of them was due to weather. I think we understand that, uh, that where he didn't play well, but at the key moments in the game where they needed a game when he drive, he was able to put it together. So I think a lot for that, you've got a veteran quarterback who's been there, done that. I think for Purdy, can he play a complete game? Cause he's going to have to, cause I think we all know four or five plays will cost you the game. And Purdy can't make the mistakes in the first uh, two games, whether the divisional round or the championship round. If he makes those type of mistakes, to me, San Francisco would lose. Tom Purdy against the Blitz, according to Next Gen Stats, uh, has been his most productive. Led the NFL with 11 touchdowns on passes outside the tackle box. So if, if Spagnuolo is going to bring it, is Purdy going to answer the call? Yeah, but I don't care about the Blitz because it's going to be Chris Jones. He's going to get two sacks. He's going to have two passes deflected. 
one of them is going to result for an interception. It's going to change a possession, and you give the ball back to Patrick Mahomes. It's dangerous, but I'm going to keep it on the line of scrimmage over there because they have some of the poorest offensive tackle play in playoff with the Kansas City Chiefs. And with no crowd noise giving one team the advantage, the get off on the defensive ends is going to be immediate. So with Chase Young and Bosa, I think they could be a dangerous combo. So rather than you think of all this superstar potential up and down the line of scrimmage and in the offensive backfield, I still think it's going to be the defensive line that are going to be the biggest factors in the overall outcome of this game. I close my eyes. I see all this, and I see Mahomes running for his life against Tampa Bay in the Super Bowl a couple right. of years when they thought they, they had the cheat code to stop Patrick Mahomes, the constant pressure. But I'll tell you, just like Azuma said, he keeps if he keeps finding Travis Kelsey like that, you know, that's trouble for the 49ers. My two cents is uh, there's just something about this 49er team. I know the Chiefs have played extremely well, probably better than they have early or mid portion of the season they're coming together they've got the belief they've got the best quarterback but there's just something about this Brock Purdy led 49er team and I'm thinking Kyle Shanahan will have something cooked up interesting for this Kansas City Chief outfit oh, our final thoughts let me, coming... guess, let me guess Jeff the one thing is the Iowa Cyclones is that right. what it is Jeff right. well, okay. no that would be the Iowa Hawkeyes and the Iowa State Cyclones <laughs> don't get it mixed up buddy don't get it confused Jim Miller top there I'm Jeff Joniak our final segment when we return here on Bears Weekly on ESPN 1000 and the Bears Radio Network this is Bears Weekly with the voice of the Bears for 23 years Jeff Joniak on the Bears Radio Network Want VIP access to every Bears home game, exclusive seating, sideline credentials, and more now available. Get the ultimate VIP fan package by visiting ChicagoBearsVIP.com. Jeff and Tom and Jim Miller at, uh, at, at Vegas. Did they give you a nice hotel? <laughs> yeah, we're at the Mandalay Bay. So they blocked okay. off basically Mandalay Bay and Delano. So, yeah, it's been great. I heard one of the hotels, and I don't know which one. I, I think it's a big media hotel. They say it's haunted. <laughs> Oh, really? say, but this is the weird stuff. So the legend has it it's haunted, and then you got the the, the practice turf not up to snuff uh, for the Forty mm-hmm. ers The uh, alarm went off early this morning, right? Woke them up. Fire alarm went off. I mean, weird things happen. And you know, these Super Bowls, it used to be okay keeping an eye out for the player that does something wrong the night before the Super Bowl. But all these little things are popping up, Jimmy. Yeah, and typically it happens. I've been. Uh you know, at away games, and I'm sure Tom has too, where, you know, a phantom alarm does happen, a fire alarm, and they didn't have to exit the the building, but maybe maybe it's a little gamesmanship uh, going on. Maybe it was, uh, you know, somebody on the inside who's working for the resort that the 49ers are staying at that maybe is a Chiefs fan, because that was pretty odd that that happened at about 6 in the morning out here, which I'm sure it didn't please a lot of the players. Tom would have been up at four, so he'd been fine. Tom, anything weird happened the night before the Super Bowl to you? Uh, no, because our hotel was getting picketed because of what was uh, uh, allegedly said by Jim McMahon. So you had to find a safe entrance to go into because they had, uh, you know, the people out there protesting. Um, but, it, again, our hotel back in the day was packed like it was the, the Beatles were staying there. So, you know, we all took it in stride, and we had a lot of fun with it. So um, I don't think any of us were trying to hide from anybody or trying to, you know, make sure our entourage had all proper entrances. Jim, we got less than three minutes. I know uh, you talked to a lot of folks this week in interviews. Did you talk to any Bears? Yeah, today I talked to Khalil Herbert. I talked to uh, uh, T.J. Edwards. So they're both out here. Uh, You know, obviously uh, Khalil, he's a big guy. a uh, big, big uh, user of the Q collar, and he wanted to promote the the safety of the Q collar. He plays with it not a lot of NFL players do. And T.J. Edwards was just wanting to experience. You know, obviously he's been to a Super Bowl. He's been there, done that. So he's just out here experiencing the uh, the moment again. Uh, and so it was great to talk to them because they're excited. They were fired up about next year. They're already turning the page, looking forward to 2024. Right, I saw some other Nicole Komet out there, DJ Moore out there. It's, of course, they're all getting asked about the quarterback position. But uh, tonight is, uh, as frankly, you know, your awards cover all things, but the Pro Football Hall of Fame from a Bears perspective. It's going to be a Bears offseason, 
and it sounds like it's going to be a Bears night. And uh, if, in fact, uh, Steve McMichael, Devin Hester, and, and Julius Peppers, who played four years here with the Bears, get inducted, it'd be awesome to see. Uh, Jimbo Covert, the 85 Bears starting left tackle and former uh, defensive lineman Ed Sprinkle, the most recent additions, class of 20, Erlacher in 18, Richard Dent, Tommy in 11, and Michael would join Peyton, Singletary, Dent, Hampton, and Jimbo from your Super Bowl team. Mike Ditka obviously enshrined as a player in the class of 98. Hopefully Jay Hilgenberg's around the corner. Uh, just the pride of that in our final minute of having yeah. all those Super Bowl Bears in the Hall of Fame. Let's for not forget about Dick Stanfeld, great offensive line coach who was in, inducted in the Hall of Fame. But listen, nobody deserves it more than Steve McMichael. And I couldn't be more proud if, in fact, they announce his name tonight as being one of the newest members in the Chicago Bear family, a part of the Hall of Fame. And I'm not denying that same feeling for Devin Hester, but Steve was a really special teammate of mine and did a lot for me throughout the course of my career like he did a lot of other guys in the organization. Yeah, it should be something else. And, Jim, real quick, uh, Nick Allegretti uh, could be the starting left guard because Joe Tooney apparently not ready to go for Kansas City. Got to give a shout-out to the Lincoln Way East High School product. I uh, was a great wrestler, great offensive lineman at U of I, drafted by the Chiefs, and he did a really good job in the run game last week, in my opinion, or two weeks ago in the conference championship game. But what a thrill. He's been to a couple now, but to start in the Super Bowl. You don't get many opportunities, but a big one for him, Jim. Yeah, he, he filled in nicely for the all-pro, Joe Tooney. And, hey, a lot of times he was lined up against Michael Pierce, who's about 330 for the Baltimore Ravens. Didn't stop them. They ran the ball very effectively against Baltimore. He did a nice job. Well, Jim, uh, survive the week. Enjoy the post game. I know you're in the inter- interviews with all those guys after the game. Uh, it's going to be fun for you. It always is. I don't know how many Super Bowls you've been a part of now. Do you have that number? Uh, yeah, I've been a part of the 18 in a row, and I've played in two of them, so basically 20. So it's hard nice. to believe. But yeah. all I can say, Jeff, before we end, go Cyclones, because that's where you're leading. <laughs> <laughs> that's Jim Miller. That's Tom Thayer. I'm Jeff Joniak. Good night, everybody. Thanks to our producers and for you for listening, and to our guest, Jerry Zuma. Good night. Black and Abdallah are next. Thank you for listening to the Chicago Bears Network presentation of Bears Weekly, hosted by the mayor of Bearsville, Jeff Juniak, and Surfmaster Tom Thayer. Podcasts are available on the Chicago Bears official app. Bears Weekly has been brought to you by Apple Podcasts, Bet Rivers, IGS Energy, and Miller Lite.